Hey, how's it going everybody? It's 4.51 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Looks like February the 13th, 2019. 2019th. 2019th. <laughs> it's the 2019th. I was going to make uh, another video on Sunday. I was still feeling pretty decent. And uh, and then the and then the chemo sickness started. That was uh, Sunday during the day. So, yeah, anyways... <clears throat> wow. Wow. So, yeah, I'm just uh, following up today because if I don't, uh, I don't know what I would do with myself. I know I said uh, it seemed like my voice was pretty scratchy on Saturday. Uh, apparently, I, I developed uh, well, what the doctor said was a bit of thrush back there. And, uh, extremely painful. But, you know, saltwater gargles and, um, other things, you know, that they, they put you on about, uh, you know, at least a dozen, uh, other medications when you're being treated, uh, with chemo. So, I'm gonna continue on that same line. Uh, concerning Joseph Smith, but I do know, uh, based on comments, emails, dialogue in general, I understand that one thing is very clear. Joseph Smith and, uh, and the LDS church and of, <laughs> of course Brigham Young. These are not characters without controversy. Okay, I, I'm really well aware of that. So, don't get me wrong. <clears throat> don't, you know, uh, don't think I'm going, going into this uh, w with too much naivete. Uh, you know, as... <sighs> As far as all of the controversies surrounding Smith, LDS, Young, the early years, was he, was he not a prophet? When did he write what? Was it inspired? That's not, that's not in my, that, that's not in my vision right now. <clears throat> this is, this is mostly looking at some involvements that he may have had. And, well, hopefully, we'll get to, uh, I think, some important things that were going on in the nation at the time. See, there's this, I've mentioned before, this uh, Rivers and Harbors Act of 1824. <clears throat> Excuse me. It was when uh, John Quincy Adams was in office. Um, for those who aren't too familiar with J.Q. Adams, because he didn't have quite the auspicious career or the uh, the amount of, let's say, popular <coughs> quotes or writings attributed to him. Okay, he was he was popularized at least by uh, Steven Spielberg <laughs> in uh, in just another one of Spielberg's propaganda pieces called Amistad, which ah uh, so uh, apparently historically J.Q. Adams did do the things that he's attributed to doing in Amistad. Um. And, you know, for me, when I consider all of the factors of history that have been kept hidden, and I look at what he did at that time, to me, I don't know. To me, it either looked like showboating, or somebody was... There was some, some sort of interest in it for him to do what he did <clears throat> concerning Amistad and the blacks of Amistad. 
Uh, yeah. But, you know, as with any Steven Spielberg film, um, you know that at least 90% of it's got to be garbage. So, who knows. But, yeah. He was the president who was sitting in office when the uh, Rivers and Harbors Act of 1824 was enacted. Now, a lot of people might think, you know, what does that have to do with the price of eggs, river, rivers and harbors? That was just, you know, it was something that Congress uh, passed to help commerce. Dredging harbors, uh... Oh, dredging rivers. Well, that's that's kind of the that's kind of the superficial story, you know. Dredging harbors, dredging rivers. Um, getting some surveys on roads, putting in some good roads. Uh, the problem is when you when you start searching <clears throat> for the uh, the ins and outs of what all they were up to because you know we can see that with the current act that was passed s1 uh, strengthening america's security in the middle east act there was so much more to that bill <laughs> than what was on the title and uh i don't think that you know they're doing anything too new these days so uh they padded a lot into that too and a lot of it had to do with surveying. And they sent out surveyors. And they did a lot more to the landscape <clears throat> than, uh, than what they typically talk about. And that's part of what bothers me. Now, I've got a video. Uh, it's queued up. It's about nine minutes long. And I was hoping to actually just be able to play a few of the relevant portions of it but this is going to give you a little taste of of what I see the issue with this Rivers and Harbors Act and what was going on in the United States at this time uh, in the 1800s okay so this guy here his channel name is Michael P and even though the um, the narrative that he has as far as his base narrative is very different than mine and it's <clears throat> it's sort of the popular narrative uh, concerning structures in North America there's a few factors here that that I think are of of great importance so <clears throat> I'm gonna play a few a few portions of this Iowa yet there have been many people in the United States who insist that every single one of these artifacts are fake my personal opinion is because it opposes the idea that nobody sailed to America before Christopher Columbus. Well, yeah, it, it opposes a lot of ideas. Um, the problem is, um, they're, they're already starting to, to write and insert a counter-narrative to that, okay? Um, <clears throat> it, it's right now still considered kind of fringe but it's out there um, and the one thing that is always consistent no matter what they'll give up uh, no matter what ground they'll give up they stick so hard to this narrative that it had to be who we consider Indians were here and I have to tell you I, I think that our knowledge today of even the people that were here when various peoples were brought over the sea to this land uh, is, 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 is dreadfully incomplete. Uh, no, I don't think there were a lot of them. And I'll be 100% honest. I think that most of the the structures and earthworks that were here or still exist to this day are often erroneously attributed to them and I'm gonna tell you why this has a lot to do with 
ideas that um, a lot of my subscribers express uh, concerning their interest in mud flood, Tataria, certain worldwide phenomenon. It is, it's this, just stay with me. So, okay, <clears throat> let's take, uh, let's take like Southwestern Asian, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Southwestern Asian uh, temples and architectures, for one, okay? Temples of India. And uh, by the way, listen, I want to just tell you, I'm sorry. I know and I can tell that um, <laughs> because I'm having to take certain things for my throat, my mouth and my throat just, I know they they don't sound great. And I'm doing my best to not uh, transport that through the mic, but um, uh, I'm limited. Uh, so bear with me. These... Uh, these structures, they're all, all around the world. Things that maybe they'll call temples. Were they temples? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I've seen so many structures that they're, they're attributed as, as temples. Or sometimes palaces. Sometimes forts. Were they? I don't know. But a lot of them are pretty amazing, architecturally, and they're standing to this day. So that's a testament to how they were built as well. <clears throat> One of the big problems that I have with just giving a blanket uh, accreditation to the people who, let's say, to the people who we met when the earliest peoples from over the Atlantic were brought here. I guess that's the best way to say it. Because that whole history is so messed up and abused, too. To just give them a blanket, blanket accreditation, I see it as folly why the first thing is for the most part unless you want to just chalk up all the records as being erroneous and if so i guess that's your prerogative what seems to be a consistency is you go to to various places around the the, the world you'll find sites of magnificent structures and if the structures aren't there a lot of times pretty impressive earthworks and or foundations however the peoples who seem to be encountered in all of these various places first off culturally don't match what cultural indications we can find in, on, and around these sites. The other thing is they tend not to be living there. If we go around the world and find magnificent structures all over the world, and yet at the same time the peoples that we meet <clears throat> are living in grass huts and teepees and extremely basic accommodations for the most part, then to automatically say these are the people who did this is, I think, on its surface altogether erroneous. On the other hand, when we see a number of structures that clearly have additional primitive building atop them, <clears throat> and people who are living in a primitive way, 
are, say, still there and on site. To also attribute those things to them, again, is erroneous. Anybody can come across a structure or a, a city of structures and deem this place looks like a good place to live and do some primitive building and repairing to those uh, structures and dwell there. And with the sort of lifespans that many of these structures the world over seem to enjoy, it doesn't seem strange at all that a group of people may be able to find a home in these places that they never built uh, with a certain amount of repair. Uh, they find that, that they're able to dwell in this, in this place pretty well, probably because oftentimes these places are strategically in uh, good locations, um, located near a good source of clean water, and so on and so forth and so on and so forth. So the idea that any of this stuff was built by, uh, and we'll just stay in North America, anything in North America, was built by those people that now they're calling First Nations because they have to keep changing the narrative because they can't possibly deal with a narrative that might say, well, maybe they weren't First Nation, or maybe they're only part of a large swath of people who actually uh, could be considered indigenous because of how long ago it was that they occupied these lands. You see, so there's, there's a great deal of um, preconceived ideas uh, behind all this stuff. But there's at least one extremely large piece of evidence carved right into the landscape near Fayetteville, Ohio, that can't be denied as solid evidence of Hebrew people in ancient North America. And you can see it right on Google Earth. But before we get into that, just a brief introduction. The okay, the, that is actually the real meat to this video that I want to get into. Now, he's going to talk about these, uh, these people that they call the Hopewells and all of the structures that they had uh, that are attributed to them. He's going to be talking about these massive amount of structures in the uh, in the eastern United States. So essentially, not eastern, I'm sorry, mid-eastern United States, so j just east of the Mississippi. So my backyard. Um, and so I don't feel like going into into his narrative, but the important thing he brings up, that's what I'm going to go forward to a little bit. <laughs> antiquities of New York, but there was a one-of-a-kind mound builder structure that was unlike all the rest, at least as far as I know. In 1823, Major Isaac Robertdeau of the United States Army Corps of Engineers created this survey drawing of a massive earth structure just southwest of present-day Fayetteville, Ohio. This is what I'm getting into. This is what I'm talking about. <sighs> Anybody, anybody who can find um, any kind of non-fully government-produced propaganda about the Army Corps of Engineers and their history and their projects, let me know. Notice the Hebrew oil lamp. Notice the nine-candle menorah. And notice other ancient and sacred symbols such as the compass and the square. Another drawing of this structure is included in one of the Smithsonian books I mentioned earlier, Ancient Monuments of the Mississippi Valley. In a Smithsonian publication. How about that? And still, there are some who insist that this survey drawing was fake and that the structure never even existed. Unfortunately, 
The United States Army Corps of Engineers completely destroyed this structure in the early 1900s and leveled it into flat ground. Why? But why? Was it an intentional attempt to erase this odd Hebrew structure from American history? Or was it simply out of carelessness and lack of respect for ancient American antiquities? There's the question. Why? Well, maybe it was for a shopping mall. In the early 1900s. What would they be doing with it in the early 1900s that they'd have to level that now? Um... Fortunately, this is one of the earthworks whose presence and existence is uh, hasn't been wiped away. You know, the fact that Congress, the fact that Congress, think about the Civil War, what happened to the Constitution? during the Civil War. What Congress was during the Civil War it wasn't a complete Congress. And to think that they passed any legislation during that time, to me, to me personally, it's horrific. It's like, how? What, what on earth would you possibly be thinking in passing legislation? during that time, that a time of war. Like literally deliberating in Congress to pass legislation, that's just insane to me, to me, little old me. Yet, the first national park and probably the most famous national park in the United States, uh, outside of maybe Yellowstone, because there's so many, so many national parks that are just uh, off-limits restricted, you do what they say there, or you don't go there, uh, basically commandeering huge areas of land, the very first one, Yosemite. They passed legislation to essentially cordon off Yosemite from the general public during the Civil War. How could Congress find it so important to pass legislation like that? <laughs> Making a national park during the Civil War, during the Civil War of all times in our history, what was so What was so important? What was so intensely important that they had to pass legislation like that? <clears throat> Protecting that huge area. It's funny, too, because I've commented on the name, Yosemite. Uh, these people do have a really sick sense of humor. However, out of... Uh, like the supposedly the general who had gone through that area at first and admired its great beauty and made his case that it should be protected and stuff. Now, the stories concerning even how it got its name, there's no good source story. There's no good source story. And I can show you other things concerning names and, and how there's no good source story. They, they say, well, this place, uh, its name came from a tribe. Or, well, that tribe there, its name came from the place. And it's really circular. They can't show anything within the language, oftentimes, of how this place got its name. Uh, it's a real mess. So, what are they doing? What are they doing? And now, this is the Army Corps of Engineers. They did this in 1823. They took this structure out. <laughs> And I'm willing to bet this was not the only thing on their radar. A year later, they passed this Rivers and Harbors Act, which was a very, very big act. And as I said, has a heck of a lot of language in it. 
that pertains, I mean, not only to the dredging of rivers and harbors, to better facilitate uh, commerce within the states, but it had a great deal to do with surveying, surveying land, and what they did with the land after that, you know. And this this idea, the Army Corps of Engineers and, and all this propaganda about what they do and what their purpose is, you know, they, they ruined uh, an area that I grew up in. It was, it was a beautiful place. It was the Kankakee River Basin in northwest Indiana. And it was, it was such a, a, a center for great fishing and hunting because of the way that the Kankakee meandered through this area. So there were a lot of wetlands. So at some point, the Army Corps of Engineers, they come in because uh, I guess because we just needed that few extra acres of farmland and let me tell you something <laughs> they may have rerouted and dredged that river and as far as I'm concerned scarred it permanently maybe someday it can go back to its old path but they didn't really accomplish what they said I mean Look, the one thing I remember from growing up around there, and we didn't live too far from the Kankakee, and our school bus route pretty much covered uh, a lot of areas uh, north of the Kankakee in that stretch uh, of that town that I lived in. And most of those roads uh, out there were all dirt roads and all built up. They were built up from the surrounding fields or land in general, and they had to be because all of that land was still lowland and uh, with the Kankakee being a mud bottom river. Uh, every time the Kankakee was high, those wetlands, you know, the farmer's fields were covered. I remember um, just being a little, a little child, you know, and looking out over all these fields, you know, covered with a few inches of water and thinking it looked like seas, oceans, you know. <clears throat> so, that's the kind of stuff that the uh, Army Corps of Engineers, that's, that was their MO. Uh, how they improved it, I have no idea, because before they dredged the Kankakee, rerouted it, it drew in a lot of people. A lot of people wanted to come there and hunt and fish. A hunter and fisher's sort of paradise. There were U.S. presidents that were said to, to come and stay there for the hunting and fishing. So why they would do that, you know, it's, it's your guess. So, okay. Preemptively, we talked a little bit about these these earthworks and these structures that apparently seem to have been all over the United States and they're getting oftentimes that uh, through financing of the River and Harbors Act they're they're being surveyed uh, as as this gentleman did and and remember outside of the Rivers and Harbors Act you had the Smithsonian that would privately finance a lot of surveys as well tons of them I mean the interest in the landscape of America and specifically out west starting in the mid 1800s was really a freaking weird weird thing so now at the same time there is a group of people that are going to be led quite far out west and why why they went so far where they ended up 
what was there when they got there and their history those are things that I can't right now cover but I can go back and read a bit of this gentleman's assessment of Joe Smith and his involvement not only with the Kabbalah but the occult in general and to me things like that speak volumes and again some people who who maybe are new to a lot of these concepts would find that how strange it is because I know that I know that most of the people out there that do things like cover mud flood or cover flat earth or cover a lot of 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 uh, cutting edge uh, let's say paradigm shifting concepts they don't cover the JQ and if they do uh, they do it in a way that is very friendly uh, towards their secret role in history now that's going to be one thing you're going to find very different with me why is it because I'm obsessed I don't think so I think it's because I'm committed to what is the truth of the matter one thing I've had to find out that has just been one paradigm buster after the other is that you quite literally have to consciously consciously ignore the JQ if you're if you're really a, a very sincere student of history and current events whatever you have to consciously ignore the JQ because it is going to pop up in just about every facet of any serious research you do so where I had left off was right after uh, the author of this article that I've been reading from Joseph Smith and the Kabbalah uh, he quotes from a guy by the name of Bloom and a good deal of the basis of this paper has to do with the uh, interpretation or criticism of Bloom concerning the writings attributed to Smith this Bloom now it doesn't say this here and I don't specifically know who this Bloom is as far as academicians go but uh, be be forewarned <laughs> um, this Bloom has a great deal of understanding and it seems to be intimate of Kabbalah Bloom and names that have Bloom in them are not always but can frequently be Jewish names uh, you know Bloomfeld Gold Bloom or Bloom sometimes with two O's sometimes with one U it always needs to be observed this is the issue this is what I told you it is just unfair to leave out the Jewish aspect of history if there is a Jewish aspect in it to be perused to leave it out is dishonest that is a lie so what Bloom is doing is he's saying that although it doesn't seem necessarily overt to him that he believes that just from the nature and form of writings of Smith's that he has seen that this man's mind or the mind of whoever penned it was extremely familiar with Kabbalah and Hermeticism So, what is Kabbalah? That I don't think can be answered very simply or easily. Uh, Kabbalah is not a book. A lot of people have presented Kabbalah as a book. 
I think it's more fair to say it is a conglomeration of writings. Uh, the most popular of which is called the Zohar. And the nice way that most people say is that Kabbalah is essentially Jewish mysticism. Um, perhaps that's true. Or perhaps Kabbalah is simply the old world religions of various uh, aliyim that were not Yahweh. Um, that has uh, been held in trust uh, by these folks for a long time and and now is has become uh, again overt as opposed to it having to remain covert in various times, situations, countries, cultures. Um, there are a lot of people who if they're criticizing a Jewish mindset, this is specifically a mindset that, you know, would look at people who are non-Jewish as cattle and their savior mentality as though they would be the ones who would uh, ultimately uh, save the world through their devices. A lot of people actually will go and attribute that to, to the Talmud and Mishnah, their rabbinical writings. At the same time, there are a number of people who would say, oh, that's for, far more Kabbalistic. Their, their ideologies are uh, far more closely linked to, uh, to mysticism than rabbinical thought. Perhaps that's the case. Now, this man goes on in this article and he says, While I would not diminish the inventive genius of Joseph Smith, careful reevaluation of historical data suggests there is both a poetic and an unsuspected factual substance to Bloom's thesis. And we just went over Bloom's thesis. Though yet little understood from Joseph's adolescent years forward, he had repeated sometime intimate and arguably influential associations with distant legacies of Gnosticism conveyed by Kabbalah and Hermeticism, traditions intertwined in the Renaissance and nurtured <laughs> through the reformative religious aspirations of three subsequent centuries. Though any sympathy Joseph held for old heresy was perhaps intrinsic to his nature rather than bred by association, the associations did exist, and they hold a rich context of meanings. Of course, the relative import of these interactions in Joseph Smith's history will remain problematic for historians. Efforts to revision the prophet in their light, or to reevaluate our methodology of understanding his history may evoke a violent response violently respond evoke a violently response from traditionalists that's interesting nonetheless nonetheless these is substantial documentary evidence material unexplored by bloom or mormon historians generally supporting a much more direct kabbalistic and hermetic influences upon smith and his doctrine of god than has previously been considered possible whoa the uh the wording and syntax is hurting me sorry I'm going to try to get through this. If it's if it's syntactically a little bit too funky, I may have to back up and do that again. Uh, through his associations with ceremonial magic as a young treasure seer, Smith contacted symbols and lore taken directly from Kabbalah. In his prophetic translation of sacred writ, his hermeneutic method was in nature Kabbalistic. With his initiation into masonry, he entered a tradition both of the hermetic Kabbalistic tradition. These associations culminated in Navu, the period of his most important doctrinal and ritual innovations. 
During these last years, he enjoyed friendship with a European Jew well-versed in the standard Kabbalistic works and possibly possessing in Nauvoo an extraordinary collection of Kabbalistic books and manuscripts. By 1844, Smith not only was cognizant of Kabbalah, but enlisted theosophic concepts taken directly from its principal text in his most important doctrinal sermon, the, quote, King Follett Discourse, unquote. Smith's concepts of God, God's plurality, his vision of God as anthropos, and his possession by the issue of sacred marriage, all might have been cross-fertilized by the intercourse with Kabbalistic theosophy, an occult relationship climaxing in Nauvoo. This is a complex thesis. Its understanding requires exploration of an occult religious tradition spanning more than a millennium of Western history, an investigation that begins naturally with Kabbalah. So, uh, here's the elephant. This is the elephant in the room. If Bloom is correct, And if this uh, this this writer of this article is able to competently show that there was a heavy amount of of Kabbalistic influence in any of Joe Smith's writings, whether we're talking about um, translations of the Book of Mormon and what can I say about these things? You know, we most of us know the the mythos, or or let's just say the loose history, the claims. Yes, they're really weird. Um, <clears throat> not that really weird doesn't equal a lie for anybody who gets uptight about that. Really weird equals really weird. Now, there can be a lot of reasons why something seems weird or a situation is uh, is weird. It can be because it doesn't add up because it's not the truth. It can be because a certain amount of spin was put upon it by others who uh, would like to minimize it. Um... It can be really weird because it's true. So there can be a lot of reasons why something's weird. So when, you know, when I use weird, just weird, something's weird. Um, you know, going to the store and buying some milk and coming home and putting it in the refrigerator, that's not weird. That's pretty common. So if I call something weird, um, it's just that. It's definitely out of the norm, and everything about Joseph Smith and LDS and Mormon, their inceptions to their movements, where they ended up, and who they are today, is weird. It's, you know, it's not going to the store and getting a gallon of milk. It's different, okay? So... I know this guy's going to spend time in Nauvoo, and we're going to have to look at what he has to say about Kabbalah, Hermeticism, and a few other things. Because, like I said, okay, so I said there's the elephant. There's the elephant. It's the elephant. <sighs> Is it naive? to look at the Jewish role in history in early America in bringing white slaves and then black slaves here to well, the white slaves often to work them to death. Uh, the black slaves were more ornamental in a lot of ways. They did find out that the black slaves didn't work out very well. Um, they didn't work as well as the whites. They tended to run more often. Um, that would go to stay with the uh, 
the Indians around, um, they they were not a really great commodity as much as the white slaves. It's probably why only maybe 4% were ever even brought to North America, blacks worldwide. Um, and they probably had an issue. You see, if they brought them, if these same Jewish merchants brought them to the East, those cultures of peoples over in the East were so much more uh, or heartless about the way that they treated any living creature. You know, a, get them off the boat in a quick castration, and hopefully they live, or, you know, whatever. You just think about that. So, from the time that they started doing that here in North America, uh, until this point, so that's a few hundred years, right? Because if we're talking about 1400s, if we can even rely on that, and I know all of this, there is so much bull crap about Christopher Columbus, who he really was, who he was really financed by. Was he really a, a Jew, or, you know, was he just, was he really working for five or six uh, Muranos with, with one main backer who were going to, uh, well, we're going to this island, we're going to pick up, we're going to pick up all of these slaves, we're going to bring them back, we're going to sell them. That actually is, that is sort of like the new accepted alternate story in a sense of Columbus. The problem is, if, if it's true that by that point, the royalty of Spain had had enough with the Jews and were expelling them, <clears throat> I don't know what they were doing uh, looking for cargoes of slaves from, from, from what? From the Americas? That, from what we're told, they didn't even have a, th this place mapped correctly? What the hell kind of plan was that? So, uh, 1490s? So, if that were the case, if that really was what his voyage was all about and everything, then they had to know what was going on over here and who basically was where and what and how for a long time before that, or they wouldn't have cracked such an idea. Right? So, once again, with with LDS, with Mormonism, with Joseph Smith, here in the mid-1800s, if we leave the JQ out, we are going to end up like so many others who are claiming to be, be really pressing ahead in cutting-edge areas of research, and they're leaving that out, and it's incomplete. And I talk to so many people, or get emails from so many people that you know, they're, <laughs> they're way into uh, a lot of various alternate researches from people who will not ever, ever, ever bring up the, the Jewish involvement in history. Well, that's so stupid. That's like, that's like saying, well, I'm, gonna, I'm a serious researcher, but I don't see what, you know, the blacks' involvement in history has to do with anything. How stupid. So you ha you kind of leave a people out of, well, it's not that important. It's, that's not that important. That's ridiculous. So there's the elephant. And yeah, you know what? We may not be going 100% full bore at that elephant as we get through some of this, but we're definitely going to be, we're definitely going to be referring back to the elephant uh, as frequently as is necessary to see what kind of uh, good three-dimensional, well-rounded, truthful picture we can get. By the way, you ever seen a uh, Jewish elephant? I haven't. I'll bet his trunk is full of gold on interest, though. So, the nature of Kabbalah. The Hebrew word Kabbalah means tradition. 
in the medieval Jewish culture of southern France and northern Spain. However, the term acquired a fuller connotation. It came to identify the mystical, esoteric tradition of Judaism. Between the 13th and 17th centuries, this increasingly refined spiritual heritage was an important force in European and Mediterranean Judaism, competing with and often antagonistic to more rationalistic and rabbinical trends. By the 16th century, Kabbalah had infused not only Judaism but Renaissance Christian culture as well. Starting first with the Florence court of Lorenzo de' Medici at the end of the 15th century, Kabbalah became a potent force in inseminating the Renaissance world view. Ultimately, this movement engendered during the late Renaissance a separate heterodox tradition of Christian Kabbalah. From this period on, Kabbalah has been a major creative force in Western religions and poetic imagination, touching such diverse individuals as Jacob Bohm, John Milton, Emanuel Swedenborg, William Blake, and perhaps Joseph Smith. An understanding of Kabbalah starts with an understanding of tradition. Contrary to the word's common connotation, the tradition of Kabbalah was not a static historical legacy of dogma, but a dynamic phenomenon, the mutable tradition of the divine mystery as it unfolds itself to human cognition. Kabbalah conveyed as part of its tradition a complex theosophic vision of God, but simultaneously asserted that this image was alive and open to further revelation. Thus, the Kabbalistic maintained a creative, visionary interaction with a living system of symbols and lore, and most importantly, new prophetic vision was intrinsically part of the Kabbalists' understanding of their heritage. How long and in what form Kabbalah existed before blossoming in the 12th century Spain is uncertain. Kabbalists themselves made extraordinary claims that require our understanding before being discarded. Kabbalah was, said adepts, the tradition of the original knowledge Adam received from God. Not only was Kabbalah guardian of this original knowledge, but it preserved the tradition of prophecy which allowed a return to such primal vision. Quote, Kabbalah advanced what was once a claim and a hypothesis, namely that its function was to hand down to its own disciples the secret of God's revelation to Adam. <clears throat> now that's interesting. Because, uh, A lot of things are packaged as new. A lot of things are packaged as different. A lot of things are packaged as unique. But they seem to always have this vein of this, this secret, the secret hand down, right? Um, anyways. That seems to just be common. So much, uh, so much of this junk. I mean, we're talking about the occult. Uh, in keeping with its own mythic claims, Kabbalah has been accorded fairly early origins in Judaic culture. Some modern authorities, Moshe Idol is a notable representative, identify roots of Kabbalah in Jewish mythic motifs predating the Christian era and suggests that the tradition emanated from archaic aspirations of Judaism. In a more conservative posture, the eminent authority Gershom Sholem dates first threads of Kabbalah to the initial centuries of the Christian era. With origins cryptically entwined in Gnostic traditions and Jewish myths coursing through that early epoch, Kabbalah became in its mature form what Sholem describes as the embodiment of a, quote, Jewish Gnosticism. Something I hope that you'll give note to is that 12th century brick wall. So before I even got into looking at Phantom Time, 
whether we're talking about the Illig School, Phantom Time, Fomenko School of Phantom Time. <sighs> Phantom Time. What I had was... So I was, uh, for a long time, a biblical historicist. So a biblical historicist, if you want to basically get a good gist of how biblical historicism goes, you can watch any of the teachings by most prominent Seventh-day Adventists. The reason I say that is because they are the most predominant biblical historicists going. As far as still being a, you know, a sect, uh, something with uh, a... A solid core. The problem is after a while that system as a system began to fall apart and I had to depart from it. <clears throat> what am I now? I don't know. I'm somebody who's investigating many things. That's what I am. Uh, so I'm not going to call myself a historicist, but I can tell you this. Being a historicist, for the amount of time that I was a historicist, I, of course, was compelled to look very deeply, in a very sincere, heartfelt way, into what we are told is modern history. So, if we want to consider modern history from um, the life of him who is called Christ forward modern history the things that I wouldn't see at first are the things that I now see in crystal clarity the fact that first off people who are uh, they're often given the name of things like uh, Apostolic Church Fathers, Church Fathers, uh, things like that. Very lofty sounding names. And we're told that certain ones of them who, whose writings or their deeds are still kept as records for us to see the natural progression of the church from biblical times forward. I think it's absolutely astounding the great departure in a sort of mentality from the New Testament even with as Hellenized in many ways that I, I see the New Testament being. There was still such a departure um, in all of the writings, the so-called sayings and deeds of these early figures. Um, some would argue that there was still a biblical consistency because so many of them have writings that are so extensive and full of Bible quotes I would, however, argue that I am not all that familiar with too many of them that had any kind of theology that was really all that solid, biblically. And what I mean by that is, most of them seem to echo... Mo <sighs> And, and even in a stronger way, uh, as a sort of departure. More Hellenism. And if you are comfortable with the great majority, the great bulk of the writings of the Bible, being of a completely different nature and mindset, and then going to the New Testament, which is uh, an utterly small portion of that work as a whole, and it being full of that, that Hellenistic sort of talk, thought, terms, uh, 
I don't know what to say because you don't have a consistency then of of thought or history or or doing being anything I don't know what to make of what's called the history of the church from supposedly the first century up into the 10th or 12th century there were councils there were uh, feuds that seemed to be uh, done over and over again uh, decisions that seem in some ways recycled characters that uh, bear strong resemblance to earlier characters or later characters and all of it left me ultimately with a sense of emptiness being incomplete it was so abstract and again the more that I study today with a completely different understanding of scripture than I studied then all of it just seems like an abstract vacuous uh, chronology that that was just put on paper but not real there are some situations that of course feel very real but how many of those were records in which names and specifics were changed to create this long timeline and for what reason I don't yet know <clears throat> however I will say that there seems to be like a lot of histories since the first century in various parts of the world and people would say well there's so much to these histories and these records um, how could they be in any way forged inserted or anything else okay well first off I don't think that record-keeping is something that's novel something that somebody recently got an idea that you know what I think we should keep good records of kingdoms and events and so on and so forth okay I think records were always kept pretty darn good by um, most kingdoms and dynasties that had language the ability to keep records um, and so what would be so hard if you had um, if you had a monopoly essentially on the records of all major kingdoms of the world at a given time to take all the records that they had kept for let's say a thousand years before the advent of him who's called Christ and simply transpose those into a thousand years after the advent of him who's called Christ you would have a certain amount you would have a certain amount of um, consistency in those uh, in those various records um, and you would also have what would seem to be a history of a you know geophysical location from the time of him who's called Christ forward 1000 1200 years I don't know 900 years that would seem to be a continuation of things that happened BC the fact that there are so many of these institutions that they're not 
They're not talked about a lot anymore. But there were plenty of them. Monasteries, monkeries, you know, where they mostly uh, made alcohol and uh, went over records and books, bookkeeping, and uh, gosh, to me, that sounds like the, the M.O. of another people that I'm aware of. Making alcohol and keeping books, changing books. So when we go back in time and we hit these brick walls, well, that always makes me think of what would it really take? What would it really take to convince the world that time had passed that, that had not? I don't know. I don't know how hard that would be. What you would have to do, in my estimation, is create a dark age. I think it's very similar to what they're doing right now. They have, they have up to a point created a, a dark age, a type of dark age, information. Uh, and fooling with information a lot today in front of our own eyes. How much harder would it be to do that many centuries ago? Not sure. But an idea, and, I, and this is the idea that I can't get over, is that a thousand years ago, you know, nobody could figure out how useful pants were. So, oh, well, what's... What's a tunic? A tunic is a tunic is a an article of clothing um, that various translators have inserted for various articles of clothing. Um, there is a, a type of article of clothing that the priest would wear in the Book of Leviticus. He was talk um, that he was told that he would be wearing, and it has the root in it of bod bod meaning separate. And you know, when you think of things like pants or pliers, scissors, you're thinking of an object that consists of two separate components that make up the whole. I just think it's smart whenever we come across anything that's just uh, a preconceived notion. I used to have, you know, there are so many of these books, and I, I don't think it's on accident. They're called, um, uh, like, Manners and Customs of Bible Times, full of pictures, too. They definitely want you to have pictures. They want you to have pictures of people that look very Arabic, um, occupying the, uh, the, the characters, or their, their caricatures, of, in fact, Bible characters and events. And I think these things have been instrumental in redrawing our ideas of the way things were in Bible times. They didn't have pants. Everybody wore robes around. Um, you know, expressions like, gird up your loins, that is an expression. Uh, that was used by by King James era translators that came from expressions uh, that were contrived by people before them. That does not necessarily echo the original text. Until a few <laughs> until a few more people start start coming around and wanting to to commit s some of the time to, to start lear learning what is Obri, um, as I've been able to uh, articulate it thus far, it's going to be difficult to, to fully express to you the, the serious disconnect between 
what is original text and what we've come to know today and all the preconceived notions that have been able to be inserted um, in the meantime. So just to pick through this, because there's no way I'm reading his whole article, that's not the point of it. I, I know the title, Joseph Smith and the Kabbalah, sure. But it involves so much more. Okay, I'm talking about so much more. Yes, I'm talking about what did Kabbalah have to do with Joe Smith? What did he have to do with the Kabbalah? Because if he had anything to do with the Kabbalah, he had to do with Jews. Um, and I don't have to I don't have to roll over the importance of that again. Um, just as if, you know, if it was Islamic, okay? Anything we have to look at that because we want to see a number of things. We want to try to put this together. We want to understand some things. We want to understand a few things about America. The, the idea, whether in the long run, whether in the long run some of my theories prove out to be true or not, is not necessarily the central point or thrust of everything. There, there is some, in my estimation, there is some common sense that we have to apply. And, and one, one thing that is, I think, should be just like rudimentary common sense is that we know that various peoples of the world, and I would, I would have to say basically noadic peoples, who were all the same basic type of people, at least from the start, with those three patriarchs being his three sons, that they were sea people from the start. Okay? Our people are sea people. You you find, okay, and I, this term is such a, it's, it's almost as lame and uh, erroneous term as something like Indian for the people that were in America a long time ago. Whites. Okay? You find white civilization, you find sea people. Period. And, you know, if folks say, well, there were sea people amongst many other types of peoples in the world, well, we do have other, other people types, other races that have uh, navies, merchant ships, and, and that sort of thing. That's very true. Where did they get that from? Where did they get their uh, farming and agriculture uh, techniques from? Was it inherent in them from the start or not? I don't have the answer. You don't have the answer. We have guesses. We have things that academics have told us. So, <clears throat> I'll just I'll I'll continue here with 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 a little bit of what he has to say about Kabbalah and Zohar. It's important, and I'm going to try to actually go push through to a few of these other things because it's it's all a big intertwined story. Okay, so we have to understand a lot of parts to even try try to get this thing to emerge. Not only what Joe Smith might have had to do with, with Kabbalah and European Jews in Nauvoo, Illinois, you know, what he had to do with them before that when he was uh, a, a Mason, okay? Because if you're a Mason, you, you either directly or indirectly have something to do with uh, certain Jews. Um we need to understand why the River and Harbors Act of 1824. Why was the Army Corps of Engineers uh, surveying what they were surveying, uh, destroying what they were, rebuilding, rerouting, refacing at around this time in history? Why things happened after, before? It's a great big picture. It's got a lot of parts. So this author goes on, he says the Zohar, so this is kind of the most well-known Kabbalistic writing, but he does say the Zohar was, however, what a modern student might call a forgery. It was a pseudopographic work. 
a work written in the name of an ancient author by a contemporary figure. This was a literary device popular with Kabbalists, as it had been with Gnostic writers in earlier centuries. Though probably based on oral tradition, Scholem or Sholem argues that the majority of the Zohar is the work of a single 13th century Spanish Kabbalist, Moses de Leon. To understand how a pseudepigraphic work or a forged book could remain at the center of a religious tradition for centuries requires consideration of the Kabbalistic experience. <clears throat> and then he's going to talk about a lot of traditions behind uh, Kabbalah. And I find it very funny that a lot of works that that Jews don't want to take credit for, but want to adhere to, they were pseudepigraphic. We can't quite say who did it. Uh, not our thing. Some things are our thing. Uh, it, it, nothing ever concrete. Never a straight. Never a straight answer. NASA. So he's going to get into the specifics of the philosophy. He says, for instance, now, some of you can say from maybe a greater understanding of Mormon works in general, what they once believed, what they do believe, how much of this is lining up, and what's not. He says concerning Kabbalistic thought, the complex divine image composed of the multiple vessels of divine manifestation was also visualized by Kabbalah as having a unitary anthropomorphic form. God was, by one Kabbalistic recension, Adam Kadmon, the first primordial or archetypal man. Man shared with God both an intrinsic, uncreated divine spark and a complex organic form. This strange equation of Adam as God was supported by a Kabbalistic cipher, the numerical value in Hebrew of the names Adam and Jehovah, the tetragrammaton that they call yod He vav He, was both 45. Thus in Kabbalistic exegesis, Jehovah equaled Adam, Adam was God. With this affirmation went the assertion that all humankind in highest realization was like God. The two realities shattered each other. Okay, here's where we stop, and I clarify. Numerology. Gematria. Those who teach about Gematria and its Hebrew roots understand this. <clears throat> Obri characters, and that is the character called Hebrew without the Nakud of the Mazora, all of that stuff added. Uh, without the calligraphic block character that they uh, formed it into over many long years, without the specific Jewish dictated understanding. Pure Obri. Those characters don't equal a number. You want a number in Obri, you'll, you'll get a number. Shalash, Alup. You want a number, you'll get a number. Ahad, one. You want a number, you'll get a word. That word will tell you the number. Or a series of words will tell you the number. 1,206, you'll get a series of words, it'll tell you the number. There is no equation in Obri between the characters and some number. That gematria is specifically rabbinic, it's specifically Hebrew. And that's just one of the reasons why I can't emphasize enough that people need to stay away from Hebrew and start putting some time into understanding what I'm doing with Obri. Uh, I have to say, I because nobody else is doing that. 
the folks out there that claim to be doing that, they're not. They're, they're recycling everything about what we know as Hebrew and Masoretic Hebrew, and they're just putting it into old symbols, and they're teaching you the same gunk uh, in the same ways about it. They're, it, it. It's really, it's not even funny. I wish it were funny, but it's not funny. They're, they're acting as though they're, they're doing something new or they're offering something new and they're offering nothing new except uh, something visual without the, the nikudot, as they call it. Now, he's going, to, he's going to go into the Renaissance of Christian Kabbalah and a number of other things. He's going to go into alchemy. He's going to go into Gnosticism. I don't know that I'm going to spend too much time on any of those things because, again, yes, part of the core of this is what does Joe Smith have to do with Kabbalism or Jewish mysticism or Jewish anything? What does he have to do with that? And then the broader picture. What does all of this have to do with anything or everything? What was going on in America in the mid-18th century? Did he have anything to do with it? Did Brigham Young? Um, all of these possibilities that I've already uh, articulated. So uh, I'm going to stop there for now. I think besides that little bit of Kabbalah, and again, the most important thing about this is that this guy does show that there is a great deal of Kabbalistic thought that can be linked to writings that can be linked to Smith or early LDS. Um, these folks aren't trying to hide that or be embarrassed of it. In fact, um, <clears throat> it seems to be uh, an attempt to make it far, far, far more overt. So, uh, we'll see how that adds up next time. And hopefully, you know, my mind, my throat, my physical body in general uh, gets stronger. And thank you, everybody, who has uh, been praying for me and sending such good words, uh, well-wishing and kindness and everything else my way. So, see you next time.